Good afternoon and welcome to the 215th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. Today is the second of three COVID calls special episodes in partnership with two great research libraries, the American Philosophical Society and the Linda Hall Library. These episodes will explore challenges and new approaches for research libraries and the patrons that use them in the time of COVID. Today, I welcome Joanna Radin and Robin Wolf Scheffler to the discussion. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, except for today when we have a special episode at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can always catch COVID calls live on YouTube. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. Please feel free also to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, February 4th, 2021, there are 2,273,515 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 451,454 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19. That's up from 447,852 reported yesterday. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. This is written in memory of Barbara J. Thomas, who lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and died November 29th, 2020. This appears on everloved.com. Barbara Jean Begelli Thomas, a most loving mother, wife, sister, sister-in-law, auntie, cousin, and friend. The loyal and responsible daughter of the late Jean and Celia Begelli, generous, strong, and strong-willed, Barbara grew up on Federal Hill with her parents and two younger, mischievous, and loving brothers. She graduated from Central High School and she worked at Fleet Bank, now Bank of America, in Providence for almost 50 years. She still counted central classmates and former bank colleagues among her friends. She and her husband of 41 years, Douglas G. Thomas, lived in North Providence. Together, they enjoyed Red Sox baseball, warm winters in Florida, adventures in Alaska, Mexico, Europe, Martha's Vineyard, and Ithaca, New York. In her retirement, Barbara's cooking and her Christmas spirit were both sources of pride and joy for her whole family. She's remembered and greatly loved by her only daughter, Allison Thomas, and her son-in-law, Rich Bindell of Washington, DC. Her entire family will continue to celebrate her life and honor her memory. Her brothers, Bob and Richard, her sisters-in-law, Angela and Chris, sister-in-law, Nancy, and brother-in-law, Louis. She also leaves her nieces, Melissa Murphy, Beth Hughes, Kelly Reitman, Shelley Begelli, Stephanie Begelli, and Missy Begelli. Her nephews, Rick Begelli, Bob Begelli, David Begelli, David Reitman, Jay Murphy, and Craig Hughes. Her great nieces and nephews, Sydney, Ella, Abby, Cole, Sophia, Lilla, Maya, Jack, Amelia, Connor, Brielle, and Cameron. Her generosity and love will be missed and will inspire her family. The family thanks the nurses and doctors who cared for her, for COVID patients and all patients, and ask that any donations in her memory be made to getusppe.org. That's G-E-T-U-S-P-P-E dot -E org, an organization that raises funds to provide adequate protective equipment to doctors, nurses, and workers on the front line of health crises. Okay, I'd like to Bring back Adriana Link, who you met yesterday. Adriana is the head of scholarly programs at the American Philosophical Society. Adriana, great to see you again. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay, Scott. How are you? Fine. Really enjoyed the conversation yesterday and wanted the chance to debrief with you a little bit after it was over. What were some of the themes that came up that really grabbed you? 
Yeah, I mean, I really appreciated um, the points that both uh, Patrick Spiro, um, my director at the APS, and uh, Lisa Brower, uh, who's at Linda Hall, made uh, about the uh, you know the challenges that they faced in the last couple of months in, in connecting uh, researchers uh, with materials. But you know what I really appreciated about the conversation more than thinking about access to to things were the conversations and points they made about access to to people and one another. So thinking about uh, you know, the, the difficulties involved in, in, in the research and, and access and interactions between fellows of, and staff um, and, and both the possibilities of, of remote fellowships and, and kind of creating that sense of community, but also the serendipity that's lost in that virtual environment. So I think that they did a really fantastic job in, in kind of teasing apart um, both the possibilities of this new virtual world that we live in, but then also the loss of that human element. So I uh, really have been thinking about that today. Yeah, me too. I, I thought there was an interesting turn in the conversation where, where we really started brainstorming a little bit about what the impact, the real long-term impact will be of continuing hardship of people getting to the archives. But then those adjustments, even of sort of bespoke, uh, you know, archival visits for people who are at a distance and the potential, I think even radical potential, that that could have for some leveling of the hierarchy in the playing field of higher education. I don't want to oversell that, but I do think at this time, particularly when we've been necessarily taking a really hard look at the job market, at the profession, the responsibilities of the profession, that to me is an exciting possibility that it, more people can have access. Yeah, I think that that's definitely right. Um, so I, I've been in my role as, as fellowship coordinator at the APS, I've been working with with fellows who have been unable to come uh, because of the pandemic. And it's been really great to hear from a couple of people who probably wouldn't have been able to come in person, even under regular circumstances, uh, because of his issues of child care, uh, ch child care, um, you know, difficulties traveling to Philadelphia, things like that. So, th so the fact that we, through remote fellowships, uh, potentially could connect those people uh, with materials in a way that wouldn't have been possible before is is really um, quite an exciting prospect for us. There was another thing that was touched on yesterday, but only very briefly. We had such a, a crowded agenda for discussion, but I wondered if if you wanted to add anything to it. And this was the the question about the um, conservation in the time of all of this. I uh, I know you're all you have different roles at APS, but I know you know the conservators. What do you what's it been like for them during this time? Uh, you know, unfortunately, I haven't seen them in, oh, well, right. in quite go. some time. Um, but I, I do get the sense that they've been they've been working still to to care for materials. That it's been smaller projects that they've been, um, I think, rotating to be in the conservation lab. Um, so you know, the work still goes on, even if people aren't there in in person. Um, there's work still being done on on the materials that'll be going up in our exhibitions. Uh, so conservation treatments are still happening. Um, even even if the library is not actively welcoming researchers at this time. I wanted to ask you one more question before I, I bring in the guest today, and that is that you have also maintained an active, um, you maintain and have maintained an active research uh, agenda during this time, which I'm super impressed by. Can you give us just a little teaser what you're working on? <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, so I, I was very lucky in the midst of this pandemic to have two months of sabbatical uh, to work on my book project, uh, which looks at the history of um, uh, urgent anthropology at Smithsonian and, and really thinking about uh, the possibility of archives uh, as resources, um, you know, beyond beyond the use that they were created for. And I know this is something that, that Joanna and um, Robin both think about uh, as well. Um, but in my case, thinking about uh, the relationship between uh, anthropology and indigenous knowledge and uh, the environmental movement. So I, I've been continuing to work on that um, over the last few months. That's great. And you made some headway, headway in those two months? Yep. Finished a chapter. So it's slowly getting there. Good. Everybody, <laughs> everybody listening and watching is offering you praises right now. Well done. Well, we can't wait to read that. Um, okay, Adriana, we will, um, I will say goodbye to you, but only until tomorrow when we will jump on and chat a little bit more um, about the conversation I'm about to have now. Thanks again for helping to put these together. Great. Thanks so much, Scott. Okay, I want to introduce the guests that I have today. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Joanna Radin 
is a historian of life and human sciences at Yale University, where she's associate professor of history of medicine and a core member of the program in history of science and medicine. She's also affiliated with the Department of History, Anthropology, and American Studies, as well as programs in ethnicity, race and migration, and religion and modernity. She's the author of the book, Life on Ice, A History of New Uses for Cold Blood, which appeared with Chicago in 2017. She's also co-editor with Emma Kowal of Cryopolitics, Freezing Life in a Melting World, which appeared with MIT in 2017. In addition to numerous academic journals, her writing has also appeared in the Washington Post, LA Review of Books, and The New Inquiry, and she's currently working on a new book tentatively titled Surreal Science, Michael Crichton, Mass Media, and the Manipulation of Modern Life. She's also the co-editor with Adrian Johns of the Science as Culture series at University of Chicago Press. My second guest is Robin Wolf Scheffler. He's an associate professor in the program in Science, Technology, and Society at MIT. His first book, A Contagious Cause, The American Hunt for Cancer Viruses and the Rise of Molecular Medicine appeared with the Chicago Press in 2019 examined the century-long effort to identify a human cancer virus and develop a vaccine. His current research, supported by the National Science Foundation, focuses on the history of the biotechnology industry in the greater Boston area. Joanna Radin and Robin Wolf Scheffler, thanks so much for coming on this special episode of COVID Calls today. Thanks for having us. I really admire what you've been doing with this. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for having, having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And um, thanks again to the AT APS and Linda Hall Library for bringing us all together. I'd like to start the way I usually do, just to find out where you're calling from and, and how the pandemic situation is playing out there today. Joanna, can I start with you, please? Sure. Um, I am calling from um, the Quinnipiac and Hamanassets lands known as um, Branford, Connecticut, um, which is part of New Haven County. And um, the most recent numbers, New Haven County, is, along with Hartford, I think are the two um, most impacted counties in Connecticut. Um, and it looks like... Um, just yesterday, there were 482 new cases. Um, there have been about approaching, honing in on 65,000 cases and um, 1,810 deaths. So it's been up and down throughout um, the pandemic. What about campus? Have you been able to get back to campus? You're teaching uh, remotely? What's happening? I'm teaching remotely. I have been remote since last March. Um, and um, Yale, um, I, I work at Yale, and um, Yale has been um, reasonably successful in having students on campus. Um, not all students are on campus. Um, the In the fall, um, sophomores were not invited back to campus, and mm -hmm. freshmen were, and then that's flipped now. Um, and I think that's been pretty interesting. And I just actually um, taught class before, and I have a student in Perth. Um, I have students, you know, all around. Um, the world, and so it definitely makes me think different about differently about place and what community is. But yeah, I haven't been in my office um, since sometime in June when I went to get some books. Um, yeah, it's really something to you mentioned that teaching remotely, which enables you to reach students in, in their homes, not on campus. I, I was a guest lecturer for a colleague, and I didn't and my mind hadn't clicked into what was going on. This was in the spring. And somehow in my mind, they were all in a classroom in Minneapolis. But as the conversation unfolded, one was in Pakistan, they were in New York, they were in LA, they were in Chile. That dispersal was impressive, strange, but well, impressive. I mean, it really, where, when things really hit home for me was last semester in the fall, I was teaching a class I've taught many times before called Historical Perspectives on Global Health. Um, and teaching a class like that, um, when the very concept of what global health was, was, you know, being unmade um, during the pandemic in the up, up sort of lead up to the um, US presidential election was a really intense experience. And when um, President Trump was diagnosed with COVID, um, I really felt shook in a lot of ways. There was just a lot happening. And I realized that in this class with these students who were in um, over, either in or had family, close family in over 25 different countries, we had an opportunity to have a certain kind of, I called it like the first ever um, COVID era, History of Global Health Summit. Um, and it was really fascinating in real time to hear these students reflecting on how they were receiving this information and 
what, um, how Trump's treatment of COVID was impacting ideas about trust in science in countries where Trump was not in power. Um, so this virtual classroom, um, you know, I desperately um, miss being co-present with students, but it has afforded an interesting um, set of conversations um, in, in order to make sense of what's happening right now. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're here to talk extensively about research today, but I, I'm, I'd love to find out what's happening with pedagogy too. And, you know, the misery of this last year notwithstanding, I do think that there are pedagogical innovations that we will not go back from um, after this year. Let me just bring Robin in, same question starting out. Robin, where are you calling from and what does the pandemic look like there? Uh, yeah, hello. So I'm uh, calling from uh, Arlington, uh, Massachusetts, which is about uh, four miles as the microbe drifts from uh, the Moder headquarters of Moderna uh, in Kendall Square. And uh, Massachusetts is in this uh, position of having been held, hit very hard back in, in March and then sort of having sort of quote unquote controlled things and then having uh, it's sort of the tail end of a very large sort of Thanksgiving Christmas uh, spike. Uh, right now, Arlington is rated as medium risk. It's about 26.2 cases per 100,000, about a roughly a 2.5% positivity rate. Uh, the governor is beginning to discuss bringing the capacity of restaurants and uh, and gyms back up to 40% from 25%, so we'll see how that uh, goes. Uh, I haven't set foot in my office at MIT uh, since April when I filled a large suitcase with books, but I'm preparing to head back to uh, campus tomorrow to get my... Uh, COVID test, uh, which is process, process of the Broad Institute, in preparation for breaking into my office to get ready to start uh, teaching engineering life, my history of biotechnology class this spring. And MIT is more or less still uh, very remote with a few people on campus, and they've generally had uh, good luck with keeping people uh, safe and healthy. I, thank you for that update. And I, I, the image of you, probably with very little notice, packing a suitcase mm -hmm. of books is is really striking. Uh, how did you decide which ones to take? I I tried bringing his two very large suitcases, but yeah, it was a okay. very. Uh, now you, now I mean, the I truth's was, really coming yeah, out. Now keep going. Uh, no, but I, I had more more than enough books to fill them. I I mean I I mean I when I was a, a graduate student, I actually uh, traveled a great deal, and so I got very used to the idea of like picking out a traveling library of the things I had to have uh, with me, and then of course never would necessarily consult. But yeah, when we when things began to get you know, uh, very serious, I rushed to campus and I was so rattled that I left my office keys on the desk. And mm -hmm. it really was just sort of looking and trying to imagine what the next, you know, that unknown period of time of research would look like and what the books were that I wanted to have be my uh, companions. So it was a mixture of you know, things that I'd read in high school and college that I sort of keep thinking about, the things that I thought were primary sources that I couldn't replace. I have a lot of biotechnology uh, directories and then sort of the the books that I felt would be good for me to read that I still haven't read almost a year later, but I still think they'll be good to read. Yeah, that, that, thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, obviously the disclaimer of having the privilege, not having to be an essential worker and being out of my office, I, I, I want to lay that down. That's important to note. At the same time, um, Patrick Spiro said this yesterday, that the archives, he sees the archives in a sense as a, as a sort of humanities laboratory. And, and I like that when we think about COVID a little bit, because um, the idea that we could just abandon our books, our manuscripts, our primary sources that we've collected and go off and, and sit at home, not everything is digitized. We can't remember everything. New ideas pop up, we hope, particularly over 10 months. You need to get back in there and find those things. So Robin, I'll be really interested to hear what your experience is like kind of getting, getting back in there uh, once you're back for the first time in 10 months. Yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a strange feeling. Let's shift over to some of your work over this this last year, and I we're gonna we're gonna span some time in this conversation. I'd like to kind of start a little bit in the present, if we could. I want to ask you, Joanna. Let me ask you first about Operation Warp Speed, and maybe just get your sense of it. Like, how did we get vaccine so quickly? <laughs> Um, this might be a better question for Robin, um, but I mean, my understanding is that um, there were um, scientists that were already um, working with models of this kind of um, a virus, if not, um, you know, this particular one. Um, but I think there are a lot, I guess what I want to focus on, and, and I'm curious to hear what Robin would say, um, is, is that 
there's still a lot of questions about how we got the vaccine this quickly. You know, I'm a historian. Um, I haven't had, I'm not even um, a microbes drifting away from Moderna. Um, but I do, my sense is that, um, you know, there've been a lot of um, longstanding R&D going into preparing for something precisely like this, which um, was it was facilitated, but also hindered um, by um, some of the ways that resources were allocated and expertise has figured in um, developing a vaccine. Um, I personally um, was surprised that um, we were able to have um, not just one, but multiple vaccines as as quickly as as we did. Robin, let's bring you in on that on that too. The the pace of Operation Warp Speed was startling to me. But other folks I've talked about it said, "Well, you can't just take ten months is the wrong temporality." I had also gotten used to so many failures of the Trump administration that I also found it um, jarring when there was that success. But then I had to stop myself and say, "This is not something Donald Trump did." Uh, yeah, so where to begin? I, mean, I think actually this war talking about warp speed like cuts to the essence of what makes biomedical research so beguiling. And this is sort of if the physicists had the atomic bomb, which is the suggestion that like a few people scratching equations on a chalkboard are one Manhattan project away from unleashing this terrible force upon the world. Uh, biomedicine has vaccines. The suggestion that sort of some remote area of research with no real connection to the problems of the world, it would seem, will in a matter of months be transformed into an incredibly powerful tool to confront sort of a, a looming pandemic. And that's, of course, the, the promise. The truth is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more tricky. Uh, I mean, the, the mRNA vaccine uh, platform uh, that uh, Warp Speed sort of really promoted and pre uh, resulted in the Pfizer, BioNTech, and, uh, and Moderna vaccines uh, had been in development for a while. Uh, Caitlin Carrico, who's a Hungarian researcher who had been working at the University of Pennsylvania, had really sort of figured out a lot of the, the theory behind how MNR, mRNA could be used to manufacture just the protein part of a virus to sort of cue mm -hmm. the immune system. Uh, but then there were all these other intermediary uh, steps, such as figuring out how to deliver it. Uh, but meanwhile, I, the other the sort of one of the other things I think about is success and failure, like mRNA had been thought about as a platform for anti-cancer drugs. And the problem there is that mRNA needs to be given to a patient multiple times, and it's very fragile. Uh, and the really interesting thing about a vaccine use of mRNA is that you only have to do it once or twice. So suddenly this failed or frustrated uh, cancer therapy platform becomes a really apt vaccine platform. Although, uh, as Joanna mentioned, no one was really investing in it as such. There'd been a few efforts and the had been queued up, but uh, one of the you know things that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded of us very forcefully is that global health uh, vaccine development uh, these are things that are not necessarily major targets of investment, uh, either by uh, government or by by industry. And so Operation Warp Speed then sort of stepped in to very aggressively sort of promising to change that uh, through the investment of what seems like a large amount of money, but it's really a fairly small amount of money if you set it against the total amount of money that we spend on on healthcare. But it was uh, notably successful by the same reason that uh, you know other defense contracts work, by promising to mm -hmm. remove the financial risk associated with uh, setting up a factories and it actually yeah overlaps with how the polio vaccine was rolled out and any number of sort of other vaccines in the past. I, I appreciate that context and you're sort of invoking the Manhattan Project, which I suppose is so deeply rooted in the way that politicians, um, policymakers, university presidents, NSF, anybody thinks and talks about research these days. You know, everything is a Manhattan project and this is this sort of technological fix mindset which is so prevalent not only in the united states but i think especially in the in the united states and i've worried a lot about war metaphors throughout this this pandemic um i don't know joanna i mean why do we keep replaying the techno fix why do we keep rehearsing the manhattan project every time there's a big societal level problem we want to solve our solution is to resort to a metaphor of destroying cities on the other side of the world Oh, that is a big question, and it has a lot of different factors that go into the answer. I would actually say I've heard um, the moonshot maybe as often, I mean, which mm -hmm. is, of course has a militarized dimension and kind of vaguely connects to some of the things that Robin and I, um, our, our own work touches on. Um, but this idea of a moonshot, like, you know, I think that 
captures people's imaginations and something I'm really interested in is like, what are the kinds of stories that we have told ourselves about science that we tell ourselves about our relationships with our machines, like more broadly. And, um, you know, science is, has been militarized, um, you know, at least in the United States from the beginning of colonization. Um, so there's um, a way in which like the war metaphors are overdetermined um, as a way of thinking about, you know, what it is that um, people are trying to accomplish. But I also think like, um, you know, in terms of like a, a techno fix, technology, even when it's hard, it's still easier than social fixes. Um, social fixes require a lot more input, a lot more, um, um, flexibility, a lot more um, humility, frankly, um, to do them well. Um, and I think that, um, you know, giving seeding um, power or directing what resources are willing to be directed towards, um, you know, private sector pharmaceutical companies that operate with m even less stringent um, oversight than like academic research, um, you know, is a way to make us all have to imagine that the problem isn't um, the kind of fraying of social relations and infrastructure and all these other things. The problem is that we don't yet have a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of those formations, I think about, I talk about this a lot with my students is, you know, how we define what the problem is dictates what the solution is. So there's this interesting, um, you know, in science studies, um, we talk about co-production, which is the sort of social and the technical kind of kind of contributing, bringing themselves into being. And if the loudest voices are saying, and we hear this, I heard this, and I still hear it at my own institution, um, until we have a vaccine, um, this is how we're going to do things. Until we have a vaccine, assuming, and I think we're, we're sort of in this hangover right now of realizing that, okay, there are vaccines, but things feel just like still feel really bad and really broken. And um, which, and I'm not even talking about the challenges of rolling out the vaccine, which is something I think that um, you want to talk about too. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want, I want to come to Robin because I want to, um, what you were just saying really touches on something he wrote over the summer. Um, but, before I give up on these metaphors, the moonshot, I, I think like when you said that, I get a little, I'm like, oh, I like that better. I, I, I like the moonshot more than I like the, the Manhattan Project for some obvious reasons. But at the same time, it still reinforces this, the nationalist, nationalism aspect, the sort of um, secret cabal of science policymakers aspect. I mean, so much of it is still, I mean, just don't ever escape the Cold War with either one of those. And I guess we're still grasping for other sort of imaginaries or other metaphors, other language to get us where we need to be to talk about something other than the technology, or as you said, the technology in concert with social action and political action. Robin, on that, I want to bring you in because um, you've both been really prolific through this time. Congrats on that. Um, you published a piece in July in the Made by History um, series with the Washington Post. I'm just going to read a couple sentences of it. Oh this is when the vaccine was really, um, that was really dominating a lot of um, science news coverage over the summer. And you wrote, it's a potential milestone in the course of the coronavirus pandemic, but the fate of a government intervention in the fight against cancer provides an important cautionary note. Vaccine development can't come in a vacuum. It needs to be combined with addressing the social and political factors that exacerbate disease and limit the access of many Americans to basic medical care. And you go on to talk about the story of Mary Woodard Lasker and the and the war on cancer. I mean, it's exactly getting to what Joanna was saying. Tell us a little bit about the piece and why you thought it was important to bring that frame to bear as we were getting so excited about the COVID vaccine. Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll, speaking of the imaginaries through which we understand health, that was one of the uh, major things that uh, motivated me to look at the sort of century long quest for cancer viruses uh, in my book, A Contagious Cause. And, the thing that makes the history of cancer viruses so uh, beguiling is that although there are viruses associated with cancer, about one in six uh, cancers globally have some type of viral connection, for most of my book, there's no cancer virus. It's just people looking for it. So it makes the terms of the search and the politics of how it's organized really, really evident. And my, one of the questions I kept coming back to is like, why was the idea of a cancer vaccine so compelling? And that sort of casts a lot of light on why the idea of vaccination uh, becomes such a compelling idea in American society. And uh, the story of Mary Woodward Lasker sort of encapsulates how 
even people who we might think of as being very uh, pro biomedicine and even pro big government could sort of take up uh, the idea of a biomedical fix uh, and sort of leave behind some of the social determinants. Uh, Mary Lasker was a uh, an art dealer, a uh, public relations uh, uh, a maven, uh, and uh, she was also a uh, committed activist uh, against disease in sort of the second part of her uh, career. And she uh, had originally started off as a new dealer who wanted national health insurance. And she was very active in lobbying around uh, President Truman's plan in uh, 40, 1947, 1948, and was frustrated uh, when sort of it got stymied uh, in, in Congress. But unlike a lot of other activists who might have, you know, kept going, she began to think of how else she could bring the power of the federal government to bear on the big problems of disease as she understood them, in, including cancer. And she became inspired first by chemotherapy and then by cancer vaccination, by the idea that you could just understand diseases as biological roots and, and solve that problem. And that meant that suddenly all of the, the role that the government had in improving people's health was no longer simply through administering care, it was through investing in research. And this is one of the ways that research becomes nationalized because uh, all the research that, you know, a huge, not all, but a substantial portion uh, that goes into the birth of molecular biology is now has been sponsored by the National Institutes of Health on the assumption it's going to help people get better as opposed to advanced knowledge. And then it creates these awkward disjunctures where we're asking scientists who are not really interested in public health to address these big public health problems. We think that simply understanding something is mm -hmm. going to provide a solution. That's really sort of what I was thinking about. And that's what motivated me to write the uh, write that editorial because the uh, special virus leukemia program, which comes out of Mary Lasker's efforts is a prime example of that, of promising an accelerated biomedical future uh, without actually addressing any of the present causes of cancer. Well, people have to read your book to get the, the yeah, that's right. so economically told. Thank you for that. And one thing that's really fascinating to me in that um, among many aspects of it is at what point this idea of biomedical research and vaccine production kind of comes to stand in for public health to a certain degree? I mean, the two become kind of almost synonymous in, in maybe policy circles. I don't know, Robin, I don't want to simplify it too much, but I, I mean, a lot of times I just think there's a lot of slippage between those two. Vaccination is not necessary. I mean, it's one part of public health, but it's only one part. Uh, yeah, I think that's the, in terms of who we study and to think about this, I think that the political culture surrounding biomedical research in America, like it's very clear if you go to different countries and see how they talk about biomedical research. But in America, there's been this very close, very determined effort to link biomedical research as public health, as public welfare, even though that connection really leaves out a lot. And this comes back to uh, what Joanna was talking about in terms of uh, problem framing, uh, which is that how you define the problem has a lot to do with what solutions you'll go look for. And uh, we, we, we in quotation marks in America have become very content to uh, define disease problems as biological problems, which is uh, exactly what I was concerned about when I wrote the editorial that sort of leaves so much uh, uninterrogated and uh, sort of unexamined, even though it's very important. Joanna, you also published uh, a piece in that same series. Yours came out in November and it came out after the vaccine had been introduced or the Pfizer vaccine. And I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna read a couple of sentences from this. This um, piece to me was really unexpected in such an interesting way. Um, you write, in the age of COVID-19, the history of cattle breeding in the Midwest provides insights about challenges and possibilities involved with the distribution of Pfizer's potential vaccine, whether it ultimately uses liquid nitrogen or another mode of cold storage. So you're writing about cold chain technology. You write, in fact, how agricultural workers and engineers partnered with public health officials the world over at mid-century during times of geopolitical strife provides precisely the kind of unexpected object lessons necessary for surviving the present. Say a little bit more about that, because I think for a lot of people, myself included, I hadn't, I didn't know much about the history of cold chain. I've been reading as much as I can. Um, I just think it's really powerful framing and uh, some history that had been left out of any of the reporting I'd read. Thank you. Um, and I actually, you know, um, one of the things I, when I read Robin's um, excellent op-ed, and you know, I've been thinking so much about about and with Robin's work um, throughout this pandemic, and I'm really grateful for it. And I encourage everybody to read anything you can by Robin. Um, but um, you know, I was sort of just thinking about you know some of my own work, which has looked. I, I kind of I, I'm trained as a historian of um, life science and of biology and genetics and biomedicine, um, but I'm really interested in the kinds of 
unsexy technologies, namely, um, I've written a lot about freezing, um, which is something that's almost so mundane um, in the context of biomedical research, it had never warranted um, any kind of um, serious attention. So um, when I was doing my um, dissertation work, um, I was interested in um, people who were collecting blood samples from around the world, um, one of whom is a figure that Rob and I have in common, um, uh, Baruch Blumberg, um, who was um, trained as a kind of a biochemist and then is perhaps best known for discerning the etiology of hepatitis B and then going on to help develop the vaccine. Um, but what enabled him to do this work was having access, the, having the ability to collect blood samples from people around the world um, and preserve this otherwise ephemeral material in the freezer. He didn't even know what he was looking for. And so I was like, oh, I'm, I'm just interested in what Blumberg's doing in terms of like his science and research. Um, and I thought I'll go to the library and get the best book I can on the history of freezing and like science in the context of science and it didn't really exist um so i wound up writing it um but what i was really um interested in was um and i and what surprised me is a lot of the ways in which the freezer found its way into the lab and into biomedicine was through agricultural research and what that um helped me to appreciate um is that you know what we think of as in the domain of biomedicine or in the domain of public health, um, you know, is, is a semi um, arbitrary kind of distinction. And there are a lot of interesting sorts of um, flows where knowledge can flow. And so when um, the vaccine was announced, I had known for a long time, I'm like, okay, fine. If they can even make a vaccine, they're gonna have to distribute it. And the mRNA variants that they're talking about are very, as Robin said, fragile, um, and they need to be maintained as everyone now knows at ultra cold temperatures. And I started to think like, well, who are they, how are they gonna, how, how are they thinking about this? And if so, what's informing the way that they're thinking about this? And it wasn't necessarily that I was imagining that anyone developing a vaccine was gonna go call up the cattle breeders, but I wanted to make an argument to say that if someone says that something can't be done or we don't know how to do it, um, there may not be, um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't assume that it can't be done or that it hasn't been done. We may need to be thinking more expansively um, about how, um, we seek again to, to solve problems and look beyond um, this idea that, as Robin's pointing out, um, you know, there are certain kinds of experts that are asked to um, be authorities on things that really go beyond their expertise and that erodes trust. Um, and so I wrote that piece about um, the kind of role that cattle breeders had played in developing refrigeration and um, really with, a, with knowing that biomedical scientists had long, like Blumberg, um, borrowed technology, some even having gone to visit the breeders to say like, mm. hey, we hear you have this newfangled liquid nitrogen technology, can you teach us how to use it? Um, and I wanted to just bring that history to the present, mo mostly to kind of give people confidence to say, well, how might we think about what the challenges are and how might we imagine what this um, landscape looks like? And I should add that I actually got an email from the head geneticist at the cattle breeding company, American Breeder Service, that I wrote about. And he was so grateful um, for the piece. And what he said really stayed with me. He's like, it's not, not even that you, know, you named our company, but that when people think about agricultural science, they tend to think about people like digging in the dirt and they don't recognize yeah how sophisticated um, and complicated um, the work that they're doing is. And so that was um, a really, uh, I don't know, it, I like to kind of come up with a story that's maybe not the, the obvious story, but that exposes some deeper truths um, about how things are operating. Uh, I mean, that's to, to me, it's impressive at many levels, and that's when the history of science is really working. I feel like that's the kinds of, of links and stories we're trying to, we're trying to tell and particularly because it pushes back on sort of conventional notions of innovation. And it again sort of messes with a uh, temporality where we say, well, you know, here comes the disease. We can tell you when it started. We'll tell you when it ends. And here comes the fix and we'll tell you it. And I feel like it's part of the historian's job at any moment to really push those boundaries and bring more people into that discussion. You mentioned Brooke Bloomberg and I'm glad we got to that. Robin, I want to bring you in on Blumberg's story, you both, I think, familiar with his papers and his work. And I think those papers, um, part of that collection at least, is at the American Philosophical Society. So we make that connection back to the importance of the research library and the archive in the time of COVID. 
maybe a little bit more about Bloomberg, what was unique about um, his approach and, I, and from what little I know, also his collecting of biomaterials, which maybe wasn't as controversial in the time, but raises some issues that we have to grapple with today. Robin, can I bring you in on those points? Uh, I may skip ahead slightly, uh, but I mean, speaking of uh, what I've gotten from uh, Joanna is this, you know, this idea of, of infrastructure, of like the things that we overlook, but also the, the politics of what becomes a simple and what becomes a complex scientific question. And I uh, sort of, I, uh, Bruce Bumblick, as uh, Joanna can say better than I can, sort of is, uh, uses these large uh, you know, repositories of uh, biological samples to identify something called the Australia antigen uh, which is then becomes known as hepatitis B, which is a new strain of hepatitis. And he begins to think it might be a good idea to make a vaccine against it in 1969. Uh, and that's when I became familiar with, that's the, the part of his papers that I've looked at. And there too, he's fascinating, not just for the work that he does, but the fact that he becomes a member of these science policy circles and the discussions of uh, how, to, how, to, how, to, how to use biomedicine to deal with pressing problems. And there's one, uh, one exchange uh, from a, a transcript of a meeting at the National Cancer Institute in 1978 that like just blew me out of the water when I saw it uh, a few years ago. And I never, this, it's nowhere else as far as I can tell, sort of because he was a, a consultant, which was a gathering of several Nobel Prize winners uh, with the new director of the National Cancer Institute to reevaluate uh, how to deal with the problem of cancer from a scientific perspective. And you have virologists, biochemists, radiologists, uh, Blumberg, who's a, uh, a sort of an expert in, in public health. And, he gets into a fight with David Baltimore, who's a molecular virologist, over the question of whether or not vaccines would be uh, useful. And Baltimore is insisting that vaccination, as Blumberg understands it, is, uh, is too simple. We don't understand the molecular mechanism of how hepatitis might cause liver cancer, which is uh, the connection to uh, the, the war on cancer. And, and Blumberg says, well, we do this all the time without, uh, without understanding the mechanism. We did this for polio. We did this for all these other things. And uh, the, the retort that Baltimore fires back, as I'm, I'm paraphrasing slightly, is like, you could prevent every single cause of this cancer in, in, in East Africa, because that's one of the places where they've been discussing uh, the, the incidence of cancer and not address the mandate of the National Cancer Institute to deal with cancer here at home. Uh, mm. So it was amazing to watch Baltimore in that exchange with Bloomberg sort of shift from uh, discussion of complexity and trying to sort of diminish public health as not being sufficiently rigorous to suddenly invoking sort of that, you mentioned sort of vaccine nationalism, research mm. nationalism earlier. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. That's oh, sorry. I just wanted to jump in because it's, yeah, please. Um, what Robin said is is really right. And what makes Blumberg such a fascinating figure to, and his papers are at the APS, um, and they've recently been cataloged meticulous, and they're massive. And it, it bears, uh, Blumberg, so much to say about him. He also became the president of the American Philosophical Society. And um, the significance of that is that he was collecting papers of his peers and colleagues. So we have massive collections on mid 20th century biomedicine from really um, leading figures because Blumberg prioritized. So that's a kind of question for archives about, um, you know, uh, what gets in the archive and, and why. And actually one time when I was there working in the archives, um, this all of a sudden someone whispered in my ear, I still have the blood. And it was him, um, you know, because I was interested in these blood collections and we had a really wonderful conversation. But the the, the thing that Robin said that made me jump in um, in terms of these questions of nat scientific nationalism is that something that perplexed me when I first started learning about Blumberg and his career and having met him and talked with him. He won the Nobel Prize in 1976 um, because of his, his work on um, Hep B. Um, was that by the end of his career, he starts, so he, he was a Navy man. He starts his career um, basically at um, NIH in an extramural research lab, which were these like new kinds of labs after the Second World War designed to um, kind of shift from like, you know, this, the war war um, with guns to war um, on war against cancer, um, you know, war using these tools um, and the, the kind of academic military industrial complex towards issues of public health. And he ends his career as the inaugural director of NASA's um, um, Institute for Astrobiology, which is dedicated to finding life on other planets. So I was always like, wait a minute, like how do you get this guy who starts out collecting, um, you know, blood samples from indigenous peoples and, you know, and, and the world who sees him, saw himself really as Darwin aboard, aboard the Beagle, he said that to me. Um, 
and then ends his career at NASA. It, initially, I was like, this doesn't make sense. But it was because he was very interested in the administration of science. And he was very much a patriot, um, interested in preserving the status of American science. And I have this long, frustrated um, paper where I'm trying to kind of map mm. out the different varieties of colonialism that are mobilized in Blumberg's kind of journey from, um, you know, working in um, Suriname at the beginning of his career to um, NASA towards the end. But these issues of militarism, nationalism, um, but also public health and, um, you know, biomedical research, one of the things that he always said, which maps exactly onto Robin's idea, um, was that he didn't know what he was looking for. He didn't know. Um, he didn't go out to find hepatitis B. Um, he was just imagined that if he had enough blood samples, he'd find something. And so he talked a lot about hypothesis generation and this inversion of science um, mm. that, you know, I think really articulates to the kinds of things that Robin was describing about how biomedical research happens. My head is just tingling with so many different, you know, sort of ways to think with that. I mean, and you and you mentioned the sort of history of colonialism. And I've, I, I mean, even Lewis and Clark, uh, I have been a lot on my mind. I taught a course with my colleague Tiago Sariva last year about about Lewis and Clark and the botanical yeah. collection papers that are also at the APS. Well, and those are right, and that's relationship between APS and and the uh, Academy of Natural Sciences at, um, in Philadelphia. Yeah, and it was the same kind of idea, like. We're going to go out and just collect um, and without any sort of, well, actually it's very racialized in the way they thought about what they were collecting and what it would prove because Jefferson had very specific things he wanted to. But, you know, I mean, then there are really important fundamental scientific findings that come from that. So there's no escaping to a certain degree the layers here of nationalism and conquest and colonialism. Yeah. with the production of science and that's 18 that's the early 19th century right and when blumberg in his speech accepting the directorship um at nasa he invokes lewis and clark and he says this is an extension of what they were doing um and um i think there's something interesting the reason i kind of I've been thinking about the, this moonshot idea because of Blumberg, but also thinking back to a moment, um, you know, a few months ago where um, SpaceX launches a space shuttle in the middle of the pandemic. And I and people were like, oh, it's something to believe in and hope for. And I really felt this sense of despair. Like it felt like a almost um, a desperate effort to redirect attention away from Earth, <laughs> you know, mm. to say like literally don't look at anything that's happening down here. Look up there and look at where technology might take us. Um, and, you know, it was an, a very interesting kind of political alliance with a certain kind of capitalism and colonialism that, you know, Blumberg was himself um, those forces made his career, his successes, as well as some of his um, failures happen. Just a reminder, quick reminder, you're listening to COVID Calls and we're talking today about biomedicine and history and the archives and COVID-19 with Robin Wolf Scheffler and Joanna Radin. And this is part of a special episode, series of episodes we're doing in partnership with the Linda Hall Library and the American Philosophical Society. Robin, I wanna bring you back in. Anything to comment on what we were just talking about there, but then also sort of extending it into COVID times because, you know, hearing about Blumberg and his collecting and what a, Joanna shared the story of him saying, you know, still finding his pride. I still have the, the blood, as you said, he said, um, we're living in a time in which there's sort of great collecting of biological materials going on in the name of this really rapid COVID, um, you know, research that's, that's going on. I don't know, Robin. I mean, we don't worry about that. We just do the collecting because we have lives to save and we sort it out later. That seems troubling to me, but I, I don't know exactly how to think about it. Well, I, I think I want to keep with the metaphors uh, for a moment, just because I think that's actually a place where the APS collections were really helpful for me as I was working. And that's given me a very different perspective on COVID than I might have otherwise had. I, I mean, we have the, the frontier, we have war. Uh, we have uh, moonshots and we have uh, warp speed, which is kind of a fusion of, uh, you know, Star Trek and uh, I and uh, I guess sort of uh, and the moonshot. But 
these all are ways of thinking about uh, how to structure biomedical research, and which is inextricably, as, as Joanna was talking about, tied up with the knowledge that we get. It's not like you can talk about one or the other. I, and I think the war, the war metaphor is like a very important one around cancer, the war on cancer. Uh, and Susan Sontag is really very critical when she talks about sort of the language of uh, metaphors of illness. Uh, but, and that's, sort of, that's very much the, the approach that I came to when I sort of started digging around the archives, but what's fascinating uh, in the case of the war on cancer, uh, looking at sort of someone like Peyton Rouse and others in the APS papers, is that it's literal for them. Like the structures that they pick up to research against cancer are patterned on military industrial R&D strategies. Uh, and in the same way though, it supply, the war supplies in that sense, both an organization, but also as you were um, implying, sort of a moral logic, that there's sort of a crisis mm -hmm. that we have to do things and we can't worry too much about it. And I certainly think that from uh, my perspective, and I'm sure Joanna has other examples she can think of, uh, you know, the blood samples taken uh, for the uh, po for researching polio uh, or, for re or for researching the link between Epstein-Barr virus and Burkitt's lymphoma uh, in East Africa or for researching leukemia uh, in the United States. Yeah, all these samples have incredibly long afterlives. And it's uh, I keep telling my students we don't know what act of the play we're in when we talk about any of this. And it really it's a it's an interesting exercise to think of like what if we're in the middle or at the beginning as opposed to at the end and i think we typically think of like yeah to having a, a a swab or having a sample taken as the end of the process but there's really this i uh, you know with uh, i got this phrase from joetta there's a whole afterlife uh to where those samples are and what they do that i think is really important to keep thinking about that exactly sort of organizing it as you're fighting a war that has a distinct end uh or you've like launched the rocket sort of causes us to overlook maybe we can extend the metaphor here a, a little bit um, this is not perfect, but again, you know, we think about the war and you think the war is over, but there are the long-term repercussions, um, you know, mental health repercussions, but also coming back to the sort of frame of justice and people who may not be able to seek justice in the midst of a war, but then later, sometimes much later, can seek justice. And I, I want to come back to that with, with Blumberg, and, but with biomaterials and in general, are there people now who are asking questions about how those materials were collected who didn't have the um, agency to ask those questions when they were being collected? I, I don't know who who's the expert on this, so maybe both of you can jump in, but Joanna, I'll let you in on this first, because I, I think that I really like the way Robin has set this up. We, we don't know the end point of the, of the pandemic. I've asked many people this, when will we know when COVID is over? And you've both got me thinking, well, we may not know until people in the distant future ask, hey, what happened to the, to the, um, my test? What happened to the biomaterials that were collected? Who gets to say? Oh, yeah, I have a lot to say about this, but I'm gonna try to um, be judicious and just saying yes, um, we're seeing lots of examples of, um, of, um, you know, or have seen lots of examples of um, biomaterials that were collected um, being, uh, with their calls for them being returned. And for me and the research that I did, I'm um, looking at the frozen collections made by Blumberg and others at mid-century, we're seeing a lot of um, indigenous um, communities and activists from around the world saying, you know what, you collected these samples from us, you told us that you were going to use it for things that would help us, um, and, there's no help. Um, so we want our materials back. And this gets even more complicated when the logics um, um, compete, the logics of biomedicine to say, we need to keep this material in perpetuity because who knows what kind of latent potential it may have. Um, and there are um, members of different indigenous groups that have different views, but who have said, you know what, this is a form of incomplete death. And we would like to we would like the play to be over. Um, we would like to have these materials returned. I think probably the most high profile case of um, critique around the use of collected biomaterials is Henrietta Lacks, um, um, a black woman who had cervical cancer, whose um, cells were collected um, at Johns Hopkins. Um, and then became the first cell lines, which is an essential technology for all the kinds of biomedical research that we've been talking about. Um, and her um, her children, um, you know, really didn't have any idea. And there's a sense that um, it's not so much, and I think this is tends to be across the board, it's not so much that people tend to be um, unilaterally opposed to the reuse of frozen biomaterials, it's that they, 
are um, resentful and, and rightfully angry that they are not um, being invited to participate in how those materials might be used. And what is interesting about freezing is that you have samples that far outlive um, the, the people from whom they were collected, which creates an even more complicated set of ethical challenges. Um, to bring it back to COVID, one of the questions, one of the things that I'm interested in um, is looking backwards. So our people, uh, people are looking in these frozen collections for prior um, evidence of COVID, where it emerged from. So they function like archives themselves for biological scientists, but also, um, you know, we haven't paid attention to all of the materials that are being collected, not just blood samples, but swabs. Um, you know, we're going there. Th this might be one of the largest biomedical surveillance projects ever conducted. Not to say that people are surveilling us, but in the epidemiological sense that there's enormous amounts of materials being accumulated. And we don't really know what happens to a, a swab once it's been analyzed. So I know at Yale, they also go up to Broad, um, but I'm working with a really brilliant um, medical student named Haley Larson, and we're trying to trace this um, afterlife of the swab. Um, and, they're, and I should say they're after lives. Um, there are a lot of different directions that they go. And it's not like every swab is being being collected, but a lot of what we even have come to know about COVID is because of these biomaterials. Robin, I just want to bring you back in on that again, working with this sort of afterlife concept. And I guess I'm curious, there's lots of aspects of it I'm curious about, but one is just um, where are we right now in terms of the ethical, the discussions of ethics of that? Does that, I mean, maybe you can rely on history a little bit. The the ethics of biomedical research being worked at, they don't stop the search for any given vaccine or any research line and say, we gotta work out these ethics first before we let you back into the lab, right? I mean, I, it feels like that's what's happening with COVID. There's always this interplay. I, I don't know how you how you think about that or even how it's adjudicated, those kinds of questions in the, in the middle of a pandemic, but the urgency is there. So I can only imagine that right now, some of those questions are being shoved to the, shoved to the side. I mean, there's. This is uh, one of one of the concepts I would I I would you know, uh, go on quite a bit about is uh, from political science state capacity. It's like mm -hmm. what does the government have the ability to do? Uh, what we're seeing right now is we have a very good state capacity for biomedical research. We have terrible state capacity for actually distributing a vaccine. We have terrible state capacity for doing a lot of the other public health measures that be very helpful against COVID. Uh, but that also goes for ethics. Uh, a colleague of uh, Joanna and I's uh, Laura Stark has written a whole book called Behind Closed Doors about how institutional review boards uh, operate, which is one of the mechanisms that we try to, we'd hope that would sort of direct ethical research and they're local. Uh, sort of each individual hospital uh, is sort of figuring out by its own its own rights, what should be done. And this, there's been a lot of uh, debate that's currently going on around the use of human subjects as to whether or not there should be more, more uh, sort of more you know, uniform regulation. There should be somebody saying, let's stop and think about this. And that's uh, doubly hard to do if you're in an atmosphere of crisis and people are handing things over. Uh, I am trying to think like I've taken one COVID test. I can't remember the paperwork that I signed uh, to, that would sort of govern the, the afterlife of my swab. Even if I had signed sort of paperwork that made me feel good, I don't know how well it'd be enforced. Those are all sort of things that I, uh, uh, so that's uh, that's sort of a, a question that's very much on my mind that, that's uh, sort of going to be uh, resolved. And uh, the other issue too, is the status that we give to these uh, biological materials. They have this very uh, paradoxical uh, place, I think, in American biomedicine. On the one hand, they're very valued as sources of like present and future knowledge. On the other hand, uh, legally speaking, they've often been spoken about as trash. They're things that we discard. They're no longer of us when we hand them off. And that's often taken as a license to not have to think about these uh, ethical considerations. And I, you know, that seems problematic because you get into these questions that Joanna's raising about how, what, what say should we have? Uh, because we could say that we invest money in biomedical research, but it's equally true that we are at this point, investing ourselves, uh, that we are sort of making ourselves available in, in ways both uh, obvious and uh, opaque uh, for this work. And I should just add, I, I love the, what you said, Robin, and I agree with you. Um, and I think that to your point, Scott, about um, ethics and who should think about it and how, I want to kind of call attention to really the kind of 
radical um, decision to, I mean, a long overdue decision to appoint um, Alondra Nelson as the inaugural director for science and society, deputy director for science and society in the White House. This is a position that it's, I think many people are surprised to realize doesn't, didn't exist. Um, and Alondra's own, um, you know, research has been into what she calls, the, among other things, the social life of DNA, which really articulates directly to, um, you know, the way the uses that um, bodily materials can be put. Um, and she's very interested in exploring these complicated ethical issues of, um, you know, who owns the body and who are the bodies upon which knowledge about all kinds of things get made. So I'm really eager to watch someone who's coming, um, you know, from our field um, into that position of power to see what that's going to mean um, for how these conversations might become more visible and more prominent. I'm really glad you mentioned Alondra Nelson and also so pleased that she's joining the Biden administration. I had the chance to speak with her in the fall. And of course, as you can imagine, it was an absolutely mind blowing uh, conversation with her. And I've thought a lot about that conversation with her and the kind of work that she does because one of the things that's become, it's just recycled in almost every story that I read now about vaccine hesitancy, and not necessarily anti-vaccination, but vaccine hesitancy, is that we should also be sensitive. This would be good reporting, but you know, there's usually a line in there. We should also be sensitive to the fact that based on um, historical, sometimes historical cases, sometimes where crimes is used, that um, communities of color in the United States may have hesitancy when it comes to adopting um, the vaccine, let's say, or bio, you know, biomedical interventions. But they don't usually; those stories don't usually get further than than that. And I just feel like we need to get further than that. We need to understand those hesitancies, and because that's not a facile question these days. The question connecting COVID justice and racial injustice and these sort of biomedical history stories that you're both telling. Um, it's just really crucial work, but I feel like still they're kind of like points on timelines that haven't really been connected. And I don't see them connected usually in mainstream media. Maybe I'm reading the wrong media. Robin, I don't know, I'm sort of asking for, one of the things we talked about on COVID calls is, is bringing historians and researchers and journalists into closer connection as ways to really you know, mobilize these narratives any thoughts about that or advice? I mean, how can we tell those stories in economical ways that get people to realize they're connected? Uh, yeah, that's a big question. And I mean, I, I just wrapped up teaching bioethics uh, at MIT uh, last term. And part of what I was trying to do is make, make these uh, connections evident to a group of people who were, you know, I, uh, you know, falling asleep on me. But I, so I, I think that actually Alondra Nelson's uh, earlier work on the history of the Black Panther community health movement is one uh, point of reference, because uh, much of the discussion about race and biomedicine that you have encountered has been a story, uh, has been critiqued as a story of victimhood. Uh, sort of uh, African-Americans are the targets of uh, the Tuskegee uh, syphilis uh, study there. Henry Lax has something taken from her, but she, and she dies, whereas, one of the things that will probably be helpful in the long run is sort of realizing there's been a much richer set of interactions between these communities and biomedicine. And they've taken up and made different, uh, sort of made different uses of it. And that's sort of how, but what could inform the current moment for how we think about uh, how the COVID vaccine fits into questions of racial justice. Uh, the other point too, that I'd just make a, a minor point of uh, contention is at least some of the demographic data I've been reading about sort of vaccine refusal, vaccine hesitancy, uh, suggests that there's, you know, also a very high proportion of uh, Caucasian or white identified people who are doing it in the same way that we've sort of allowed uh, the Trump to think about Trump as a working class hero where many of the people who are sort of his greatest supporters were of uh, much more comfortable means. I think that we run the risk of sort of too easily taking a story of racial uh, victimhood and making it into the only problem uh, of vaccine hesitancy, although often for these communities, it's sort of a case of the soup is terrible uh, and there's not enough of it uh, type of an issue. So it's uh, going to be very important to think through that. I want to just remind folks you're listening to COVID calls. We're just almost up on time today in this conversation. And I want to, so we've talked so much about um, language actually and metaphors and, and the power that they have in terms of motivating scientific research. Um, maybe we can close out with that. And Joanna, I want to sort of bring you in on this. I know you think about science fiction and, and medicine and Andromeda strain 
for example, I'm curious to know what you think will, I mean, is there going to be a great COVID novel? Or what kinds of ideas do you think are catching on right now in the realm of art That's that are helping people process this? And I think about that, I think I'm still I'm writing about September 11 still. And I went back recently and looked at the sort of wave of 9-11 books that came just after. And the sense making that was going on was very personal for some of those authors. I'm glad they did it. It doesn't necessarily resonate with the way we think about that event today. Of course, fiction will always change and what it means over time. But I, I guess I just want to bring you in on that and, and Robin, give you a chance as well. The role of, of fiction or imagination as, as we try to process what we're living through. Yeah, I, I just I'm going to kind of answer that in quickly in two pieces. One is just the idea that um, when COVID first started, we saw spikes of people watching and reading um, almost like um, pandemic, like porn, you know, like they were like, everyone was watching Contagion and like everyone was watching these pandemic movies, almost like they were like going to tell them how to feel um, or prepare them, you know, psychologically, but also to part, there was a, a kind of pleasure in getting a narrative that they could hold on to. And I heard and saw the Andromeda strain um, picked up a lot um, in in that in that way. And actually, if anyone read Lawrence Wright's long article in the New Yorker or Plague Year, um, he's a really interesting figure. He's reporting on COVID, but he himself released a panda a novel that had been in process before. Um, um, that was um, a fictional and that some of his sources that he used to make himself credible um, in the novel actually wound up being his sources to report journalistically on COVID. So there's this, I'm interested in this kind of collapse um, between fact and fiction. But on the other side, I'm also interested in um, historical fiction or fiction that is not new, that's been kind of trying to counter the effect of some of these sort of apocalyptic or I don't know, not apocalyptic, but like certain kinds of, um, <sighs> white centered stories. So one of the things I've been hearing a lot about is, um, you know, Octavia Butler, who I really just love her work, but Parable of the Sower, which really is um, striking, you know, it was written decades ago, but striking for the ways it captures some of the um, feelings of what we're living through now. Um, so, you know, I think fiction has a powerful role to play in how we'll understand what COVID is, going back to an earlier question that you asked. Um, and we're still seeing um, pandemics through the eyes of someone like Michael Crichton, but maybe we would be um, able to ask better questions of our science and of each other if we would view it through the eyes of someone like Octavia Butler. Did Baruch Bloomberg read fiction? He did. He actually kept a journal of everything he read, everything he watched. And he said, actually, one of the things that influenced his career was science fiction um, and also fiction like like um, Tarzan and like these mm. kinds of um, depictions of, um, you know, adventures in other places. So he really modeled himself on a kind of literary understanding, popular literary understanding of what a field scientist could be. Robin, when you were packing your suitcases, first you said suitcase, and then you said suitcases, by the way, earlier, um, to clear out of your office and, and not be in the office for a few months, did you include some fiction in there? Are you relying on fiction as you're processing um, what's happening with COVID? I, yeah, I mean, I sort of, I rely on, on fiction a lot. I mean, I, I one of my uh, guiding fascinations with archival research has always been uh, has been noir fic uh, detective fiction sort of that faith that there's a completeness somewhere lurking in the archive that you can tease out and that's certainly been something I think about for guiding my my own work uh, and for like like Joanna when I'm sort of working on the history of cancer working on the history of biotechnology the the boundaries between the you know what what counts as a a, a, a reasonable a reasonable prediction of what counts as a prophecy and what counts as a, a fiction are very uh, are very difficult uh, lines to parse and it was really something that I think about was sort of imagining uh, you know these you know these, these narratives of decline and doom uh, but also optimism like the journal of a plague year is a journal of a plague year and once again like this this idea that you can put a temporal frame around it as a as a is a, a pleasing idea I uh, but the way that these sort of narratives of what disease is sort of do give us the hope of an end, do give us a horizon. And that's something that I think biomedical research has played a really prominent role in both in sort of like the techno scientific fiction of someone like uh, uh, Crichton, but also in 
in funding reports and in uh, addresses to the nation, the idea that there will be an end to something terrible and that, you know, that, and as Joanna was saying earlier, that that sort of techn techn technology and science will bring a role in bringing this chapter of time to an end and envisioning the end is a really powerful resource, both in, you know, non, you know, nonfiction politics, but also in how we relate and make sense of the experience more generally. I want to remind everyone that you've been listening to COVID Calls, and today was a special COVID Calls episode in partnership with the American Philosophical Society and Linda Hall Library. We're going to continue that tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern Time with the third in this series on the topic of researching healthcare during a pandemic. And my guests are going to be Nicole Schroeder, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Virginia, and Andrew Seaton, who's a PhD candidate at New York University. So please do join me tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern time for that. I want to thank my guests, Robin Wolf Scheffler and Joanna Radin, um, for this discussion um, in which I learned a great deal. And um, thanks for all of your writing through this time. And thanks for taking this hour today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow, 5 o'clock. <laughs>